Part 1, Chapter 2, The Inner Landscape Plagueis wasn't certain how long he remained at Tenebris' side. Long enough, though, that when he rose, his legs were quivering and some of the dust from the explosion had settled. Only when he took a few steps backwards did he realize that the event had not left him unscathed. At some point, probably when he was focused on murder, a rock or some other projectile had pulped a large area of his lower back, and now the thin tunic he wore between the Euro suit was saturated with blood. Despite the swirling dust, he inhaled deeply, eliciting a stab of pain from his ribcage and a cough that spewed blood into the hot air. Drawing on the force, he numbed himself to the pain and tasked his body to limit the damage as best it could. When the injury ceased to preoccupy him, he surveyed the grotto, remaining anchored in place but turning a full circle. Littering the hard ground, injured hawk bats were chirping in distress and clawing through circles of their own. Far above him, a beam of oblique and dust-moted daylight streamed through the dome's large oculus, itself the result of an inner of an earlier collapse. Close to the jumble of stones the collapse had piled onto the grotto floor sat Tenebris' small but priceless starship, a Rudge's gnome design, alloy wings and snubbed nose poking from the artless molosseum the explosion had fashioned. And finally, not meters away, lay Tenebris, similarly interred. Approaching the ship, Plagueis scanned the damage that had been inflicted on the deflector shield and navigation arrays, coolant ducts, sensors, and antennas. Tenebris would surely have been able to effect repairs to some of the components, but Plagueis was out of his depth, lacking not only the Bith's fine motor skills, but his knowledge of the ship's systems. Though unique, a marvel of engineering, the ship couldn't be traced to Tenebris since both the registry and title were counterfeit. It was possible that the rescue beacon was still functional, but Plagueis was reluctant to activate it. They had arrived on Baldemic in stealth, and he intended to depart in like manner. But how? Again, he squinted into the light pouring in through the oculus. Not even his power in the force was enough to carry him from the floor and up through the grotto's unblinking eye. Nothing short of a jetpack would do, and the ship didn't carry one. His gaze drifted from the oculus to the grotto's curving walls. He supposed he could spider his way along the arched underside of the dome and reach the eye, but now he saw a better way. More, a way to accomplish two tasks at the same time. From a spot mid-distance between the ship and rubble piled beneath the oculus, he immersed himself in the force and, with gestures not unlike those he and Tenebris had used in arresting the ceiling collapse, began to levitate slabs from the ship and add them to the rubble heap stopping only when he had both exposed the hatch of the ship and was confident he could force leap through the oculus from atop the augmented pile. When he tried springing the hatch, however, he found that it wouldn't budge. He was ultimately able to gain entry to the cockpit by assailing the transparasteel canopy with a series of force blows. Worming his way inside, he retrieved his travel bag, which contained a comlink his lightsaber, and a change of clothes, among other items. He also took Tenebris' comlink and lightsaber and made certain to erase the memory of the Nava computer. Once outside the ship, he peeled out of the Enviro suit and blood-soaked tunic, trading them for dark trousers, an overshirt, lightweight boots, and a hooded robe. Affixing both lightsabers to his belt, he activated the comlink and called up a map of Baldemic. With scant satellites in orbit, the planet had nothing in the way of global positioning system, but the map told Plagueis all he needed to know about the immediate area. He took a final look around. It wasn't likely that an an indigent would have reason to investigate the grotto, and it was even less likely that another interstellar visitor would find this place. Even so, he spent a moment regarding the scene objectively. A partially crushed but costly and salvage-worthy starship, the decomposed body of a Bith starfarer, the aftermath of an explosive event, the scene of an unfortunate accident in a galaxy brimming with them. 
Satisfied, Plagueis slept to the top of the pile, then through the roof into the remains of the day. The radiant heat of Baldemic's primary beat down on his exposed skin, and a persistent offshore wind tugged at the robe. West and south, as far as his eyes could see, was an expanse of azure ocean, curling white where it pounded the coastline. Rugged, denuded hills vanished into sea mist. Plagueis imagined a time when forests had blanketed the landscape, before the indigenous economy had felled the trees for building materials and firewood. Now what vegetation survived was confined to the steep-sided gorges that separated the brown hills. A somber beauty. Perhaps, he thought, there was more to recommend the planet than deposits of cortosis ore. A resident of Moon Illist for most of his adult life, Plagueis was no stranger to ocean worlds, but unlike most Muns, he was also accustomed to remote, low-tech ones, having spent his childhood and adolescence on a host of similar planets and moons. <clears throat> With that hemisphere of Baldemic rotating quickly into night, the wind was increasing in strength, and the temperature was dropping. The map he had called up on the comlink showed that the planet's primary spaceport was only a few hundred kilometers to the south. Tenebris had intentionally skirted the port when they had made planet fall, coming in over the northern ice cap rather than over the sea. Plagueis calculated that he could cover the distance to the spaceport by evening of the following day, which would still give him a standard week in which to return to Manilinist in time to host the gathering on Sojourn. But he knew, too, that the route would take him through areas inhabited by both elite and plebeian economy. So he resolved to travel at night to avoid contact with the noisome and xenophobic reptilian sapiens. There was little point to leaving dead bodies in his wake. Clinching the robe around his waist, he began to move slowly at first, then gathering speed until to any being watching he would have appeared a dazzling blur, an errant dust devil racing across the treeless terrain. He hadn't run far before he chanced upon a rudimentary trail, impressed in places with the footprints of indigens, and he paused to study them. Barefoot, lower-class Conmi had left the prince, probably fisher folk, whose thatched-proof dwellings dotted the shoreline. Plagueis reckoned the size and weight of the reptilians responsible for the tracks, and estimated the time elapsed since they had passed. Drawing himself up, he scanned the dun hills, then sniffed the wind, wishing he were imbued with even a touch of Tenebris's olfactory acunity. Up ahead, he was bound to encounter elite Conmi as well, or at the very least, their cliffside dome dwellings. Night fell as he resumed his pace. The ocean shone silver under starlight, and night blooming flora scented the human ha humid hair air with heady aromas. <clears throat> Predators of any size had been hunted to extinction on the northern island continents, but the deep gorges were home to countless varieties of voracious insects that set upon him in clouds as he picked his way through dense underbrush. Lowering his body temperature and slowing his breathing to alter the mixture of gases in his exhalations did little to dissuade the insects, so after a while he ceased all attempts at warding them off and surrendered to their thirst for blood, which they drew freely from his face, neck, and hands. Let them devour the old Plagueis, he thought. In the dark wood of that remote world, with the salted wind whistling through the trees and a distant sound of waves like drumming, he would take flight from the underworld in which the Sith had dwelled. Awakened from a millennium of purposeful sleep, the power of the dark side would be reborn, and he, Plagueis, would carry the long-forged plan to completion. Through the night he ran, sheltering inside a shallow cave, while the morning mist was evanescing from the hollows. Even the, that early, the blue-scaled indigens were about, appearing from their huts to cast nets into the crashing surf or paddle boats to stretches of reef or nearby islets. 
the best of their catch would be carried into the hills to stuff the bellies of the wealthy, with whom rested responsibility for Baldemic's political and economic future. Their guttural voices stole into the cave that fit Plagueis like a tomb, and he could understand some of the words they exchanged. He chased sleep, but it eluded him, and he deplored the fact that he still had need for it. Tenebris had never slept, but then few Bith did. Awake in the oppressive heat, he replayed the events of the previous day, still somewhat astounded by what he had done. The force had whispered to him, Your moment has come. Claim your stake to the dark side. Act now and be done with this. But the force had only advised. It had neither dictated his actions nor guided his hands. That had been his doing alone. He knew from his travels, with and without Tenebris, that he wasn't the galaxy's sole practitioner of the dark side, nor Sith for that matter, since the galaxy was rife with pretenders. But he was now the only Sith Lord descended from the Bane line, a true Sith, and that realization roused the raw power coiled inside him. And yet, when he reached out with the Force, he could detect the presence of something or some other being of near equal power. Was it the dark side itself? Or merely a vestige of his uncertainty? He had read the legends of Bane, how he had been hounded by the lingering presences of those he had defeated in order to rid the Sith Order of infighting and return the Order to a genuine hegemony by instating the rule of two. A master to embody power, an apprentice to crave it. To hear it told, Bane had even been hounded by the spirits of generations dead Sith Lords, whose tombs and manses he had desecrated in his fervent search for holocrons and other ancient devices offering wisdom and guidance. Was Tenebris' spirit the source of the power he sensed? Was there a brief period of survival after death? during which a true Sith could continue to influence the world of the living? It was as if the mass of the galaxy had descended upon him. A lesser being might have heaved his shoulders, but Plagueis, wedged into his clandestine tomb, felt as weightless as he would have in deep space. He would outlive any who challenged him. Hours later, when the voices had faded, and the insects' feeding frenzy had started anew, pain roused Plagueis' from tortured slumber. The tunic was adhered to his swollen flesh like a pressure bandage, but blood had seeped from the wound and soaked through to the robe. Slipping silently into the night, he limped until he had suppressed the pain, then began to run, beads of perspiration evaporating from his hairless head and the dark robe unfurling behind him like a banner. Famished, he considered raiding one of the local homes and feasting on the eggs of some low-caste conmi, or perhaps on the blood of her and her mate. But he reigned in his impulses to strike terror, his appetite for destruction, <clears throat> sating himself instead on bats and the rotting remains of fish the waves had washed ashore. Hurrying along the black sand beach, he passed within meter meters of dwellings, built from blocks of fossilized reef stone. But he glimpsed only one indigent, who, on leaving his hut naked to relieve himself, reacted as if he had seen an apparition, or else in hilarity at the figure Plagueis must have cut in robe and boots. On the cliffs high above the beach, artificial lights glimmered, announcing the homes of the elite in the proximity of the spaceport, whose ambient glow illuminated a broad area of the southern littoral. His destination, close at hand, each incoming ocean wave reverberated inside him, summoning an unprecedented tide of dark energy. The knotted tendrils of time loosened and he had a glimpse into Baldemic's future. Embroiled in a multi-fronted war, a galactic war, in part because of its rich deposits of cortosis, but more as a pawn in a convoluted game, the subservient Conmi turned against those who had mastered them for eons. Lost in reverie, Plagueis almost failed to notice that a massive breakwater now followed the curve of the beach. Stone jetties jutted into a broad, calm bray. 
and behind the wall, a city climbed into a surround of deforested foothills. Economy of both classes were about, but interspersed among them were off-worlders of many species, most from neighboring star systems, but some from as distant as the core. The spaceport formed the city's southernmost outskirts, made up of clusters of modular buildings, prefabricated warehouses and hangars, illuminated landing areas for cargo and passenger ships. To a being unfamiliar with isolated worlds, a tour through the spaceport would have seemed closer to time travel, but Plagueis felt at home among the cubicle hotels, dimly lighted tap calves, and squalid cantinas, where entertainment was costly and life was cheap. Raising the cowl of the robe over his head, he kept to the shadows, his height alone enough to draw attention. With security lax, he was able to circulate among the grounded vessels without difficulty. He ignored the smaller inter-system ships in favor of long-haul freighters, and even then, only those that appeared to be in good condition. Manilinist was several hyperspace jumps distant, and only a ship with adequate jump capability could deliver him there without too much delay. After an hour of searching, he found one to his liking. A product of core engineering, the freighter had to be half a century old, but had been well maintained and retrofitted with modern sensor suites and subspace drives. That it bore no legend suggested that the ship's captain wasn't interested in having the ship make a name for itself. Longer than it was wide, LS-447-3 had a narrow fantail, an undermount cockpit, and broad car cargo bay doors, which permitted it to take on large cargo with the registry number stored in his comlink. Plagueis angled his way to the Spaceport Authority building. At that time of night, the dilapidated structure was all but deserted, save for two thick-necked conmi guards who were sleeping on duty. Loosening the robe sash to provide ready access to his lightsabers, Plagueis eased past them and disappeared through the main doors. Faint light from unoccupied officers spilled into the dark hallways. On the second floor, he found the register's office, which overlooked the largest of the landing zones and the silent bay beyond. A comp that had been an antique 20 years earlier sat atop a desk in a smaller private office. Plagueis placed his comlink alongside the machine and an instant later had sliced into the spaceport control network. A search for the freighter revealed that it did indeed go by the name, the Wobegon out of Ord Mantle. Scheduled to launch the following morning, the ship with her crew of eight, including one droid, was bound for several worlds in the Oriole sector, carrying cargoes of fresh sea life. According to the manifest, the cargo had already cleared customs and was housed in a refrigerated hangar awaiting transfer to the ship. The good news was that the Wobegon's ultimate destination was Ithor, on the far side of the Hydean Way. A side trip to Munalinist, therefore, might not strike the crew as too great a detour. Plagueis called up an image of the freighter's captain, whose name was given as Ellen La. Opening himself fully to the force, he studied the image for a long moment. Then, exhaling slowly, he stood, erased all evidence of his technological intrusions, and returned the comm link to his robe's inner pocket. The Wobegon had been waiting for him.